and this lecture by Kevin Trenberth, Climate Extremes and Climate Change. Now, you heard my credentials as a media person. Um, one slight correction I'll come to. But I want to quote Professor Trenberth talking about people like us in the media. He says, the media have been complicit in the disinformation campaign of the deniers. Climate varies slowly, and so the message remains similar year after year, something not exciting for journalists, as it is not news. Controversy is the fodder of the media, not truth, and so the media amplify the view that there are two sides and give unwarranted attention to views of a small minority or those with vested interests or ideologies. The climate deniers have been successful in bypassing peer review, yet attracting media attention. In those respects, the media are part of the problem, but they have to be part of the solution. Thank you. Um, the slight correction is I started the science show in 1975, not 95. Uh, most of you would have heard the first program in August of that year. <laughs> what? <laughs> but you will remember my slight anecdote that one of the interviews <coughs> I did, apart from with Thor Heyerdahl and a few other world-famous people, was somebody called Lord Ritchie Calder. And he was talking about the then energy crisis. We had one in 1972, 73, 74. And he banged the table and he said, do you know the great concern is if we continue like this, burning fossil fuels, they go into the atmosphere and they'll have a catastrophic effect on the climate. We're certain of that, and we've been saying so since 1961. And here we are in 75, and who's done anything about it? 40 years ago. And then in 1988, the Commission for the Future, which I was then on, won a prize from the United Nations, which was not then a pejorative term, which was in recognition of our Global Change 88 efforts to foster debate about climate. And then suddenly in 2007, absolutely surprising to many people, the whole thing became, as you said in that quotation, controversial. The thousands and thousands of scientists and papers we'd been broadcasting and writing about, and the pointing, that, as we did regularly, to new journals like Nature Climate Change, there was so much science, got the flick from one or two strange hobgoblins whose job it was to debauch science and they said not proven and as you indicate the media then carried on and brought us to 2012 when it seems to me things are slightly changing i wonder if it's true anyway our guest dr kevin trenberth is a distinguished senior scientist in the climate analysis section at the national center for atmospheric research in boulder he was born in Christchurch, New Zealand. In 66, he completed a first class honours degree in maths at the University of Canterbury in Christchurch. In 72, he gained his DSc in meteorology from MIT. And following several years in the New Zealand Meteorological Service, he joined the Department of Atmospheric Sciences at the University of Illinois, and then became a full professor before moving to Boulder in 84. Would you please welcome Dr. Krevin Trenberth? Wired and dangerous, there we go. Good evening, everyone, thank you for coming. So the topic I said that I would talk about is indeed climate change and, and climate extremes, and I want to explain why that is. And so the first part of the talk, I will try to outline some of the ways of thinking about this and the conceptual basis for some of the changes that we're seeing increasingly in nature. I've been involved in studying some of this stuff, and I'm going to attempt to present to you some of those results. And drawing a line here of a fine line of keeping the scientists sufficiently interested and in not getting too technical so that I don't lose those of you who are not scientists. And uh, there are three or four slides where I was hesitant about whether or not I might lose some people, but 
If you do get lost, don't worry. It'll just wait a couple of slides, and we'll be, we'll be back in again. So let's see. Um, this opening graphic here shows in 2010 uh, the averages of the temperature departures from normal in Russia. So Moscow is here. And this was the, the heat wave that occurred in Russia in 2010 and caused all kinds of damage. I'm going to talk about that uh, quite a bit. So this is uh, a study that we have, uh, we have published uh, fairly recently. To set the stage for this, firstly, let's talk about global warming more generally. This is one way of thinking about it, as if the planet went to see the doctor. And uh, the planet has symptoms that the temperature is rising. And it so happens the atmospheric composition is changing. Carbon dioxide is increasing. So those are the symptoms. The diagnosis is that human activities are causal. And in fact, these two things are related to one another. And the prognosis, then, is for more warming at rates that can be disruptive and will cause strife in different ways that we'll talk about here. The treatment that's often talked about then is mitigation, which refers to reducing emissions and cutting down on the future carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere. And secondly, adaptation. These two words, mitigation and adaptation, have special meaning. In this case, adaptation really means planning for the consequences instead of suffering the consequences. So what's causing the warming? Well, we are in, in various shapes and forms. The emission of carbon dioxide come from various activities that humans produce. Uh, and this is, of, of course, the, the main source is the burning of fossil fuels. This is the, uh, the uh, energy supply that we have, uh, estimates of it over time. And it's pretty remarkable when you look at this in, in this level of detail to see that, uh, firstly, this is the fossil fuel component. This is the uh, hydro plus other renewables and biomass down the bottom here. This makes up by far the, the majority of it. But look at the, the overall curve. It didn't change that much until after the 1950s, and it's really skyrocketed after the 1970s. I, I think if you ask most people, they wouldn't realize just how much fossil fuel we have burned in recent times, in the last 20 years. And so the consequences of this are changes in carbon dioxide. This is the actual record from Mauna Loa. There's a sawtooth character to this, which relates to the planet's respiration, actually. It, uh, there's a drawdown of carbon dioxide in the northern hemisphere spring and the summer as the northern hemisphere greens up. And the photosynthesis takes carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and uh, puts it into the plant form, the wood and the, and the stems and the leaves and so on. And then in the winter, uh, the, or the fall and the winter, the leaves on the forest floor decay and put carbon dioxide uh, back into the atmosphere. And so this is the natural annual cycle associated with the seasons to a very large degree. This varies a little bit around the world. Uh, the northern hemisphere dominant, is dominant. Um, if we go back in time, the estimate is that pre-industrial values are around about 280. And so more than half of the carbon dioxide we've put into the atmosphere has occurred since 1970, more than half. And it relates to the previous graph that we just saw. And if you look at this curve here, you will see the overall slope of this curve. Firstly, you know, in the early 1960s, this was the slope, and then as you can see, as time has gone on, um, whoops, there we go, the, the rate is increasing. So this should be alarming. In particular, it should be alarming because we have had things like the uh, Kyoto Protocol, which is designed to reduce emissions and to turn these concentrations down to much lower levels. And that hasn't happened in spite of a lot of efforts to, to reduce the emissions of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And of course, one of the reasons for that is because of the tremendous industrialization that has gone on in China in particular, and to some extent in India, 
and it's more than compensated for by all of the reductions that have occurred in, in Europe and other places. So this has consequences, and, and the implication is not good. We're not going in the right, the right direction here at all. So to put that in, in terms of the setting of the, of the changes in climate, this is a record of the uh, global temperatures. You can see there's some zigs and zags in it, a variability from one year to the next. But overall, uh, quite substantial increases. And if we put the carbon dioxide, the annual values of carbon dioxide on here and draw a line through it, this is what it looks like. And I've drawn these two line, this, this line uh, together with the global temperatures to suggest that there's a relationship between them. Because we think we can prove that there is. To do that, we actually have to use climate models. But this is very suggestive that this overall change in the temperatures is related to the increase in carbon dioxide and the other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And so there's some variability associated with this. The, the peaks in this curve tend to be associated with El Nino events. And people in Australia are very familiar with El Nino events. It has major consequences, uh, tends to be associated with drought in Australia in, con in contrast to the La Nina events where it's very wet. And so, uh, and so there is uh, an association, and global warming is, is definitely happening. However, now I want to turn to the extremes. And there's a very good reason for, for talking about the extremes, because when we think about climate change and how we actually experience it, it's mainly through the changes in the extremes. It's not through the global mean temperature, which we just saw. The global mean temperature has gone up 0.8 degrees Celsius. You probably can't perceive 0.8 degrees Celsius uh, in terms of the change. But going along with that, with a warming climate, there are more high temperatures and heat waves and associated with that wildfires and other consequences. But there are fewer cold extremes. Fewer cold extremes can actually mean that there are more bugs that survive the winter. And that has consequences. Other kinds, not just bugs, but also uh, fungals, funguses and things like that, that that may cause certain kinds of disease. There are more extremes in the hydrological cycle. And this is actually one of, what I want to pay a bit more attention to. This is very much related to the fact that I'm, I'm here as the chair of GWAX, the Global Energy and Water. Uh, uh, exchanges pro project, and so water, the changes in the hydrological cycle are probably one of, the, one of the regions where the biggest pressure point occurs on society because of increasing demand, and water, indeed, is a major issue in Australia. So drought, uh, the heavy rains and floods, the intense storms, hurricanes, and tornadoes, and, and certainly many of these are major issues in Australia and ha is how they're changing. So here's where we do a little bit of science. A, a lot of uh, variables that we look at can be expressed in terms of a bell-shaped curve. And this is a highly idealized version where the original was done in degrees Fahrenheit. And down the bottom, I put degrees Celsius here. So let's suppose we have a place where the average temperature in this particular month is uh, 10 degrees uh, Celsius. And there's some variability about this. And so the variability from day to day reflects the, the, the weather that, that occurs. And so this is the average climate temperature. And this is sort of the range that you would normally expect. And then what happens if you have a climate change? Well, if we move it to the right a little bit, by a fairly modest amount in this case, about 2 and a half degrees uh, Celsius or, or slightly more, uh, so that we, we our, our new distribution of temperatures on a day-to-day -day basis is given by the distribution under the curve, the bell curve, bell-shaped curve B. And you can see that in the middle here, in the region that's colored green on here, there is no change. You cannot tell that events that are occurring much of the time, most of the time, more than 90% of the time, which climate you're in, because it's, it's right in here. And in fact, the fractional change uh, in, anywhere near the, the mean, the original mean, 
is quite small. And so we can actually quantify that and look at the differences. Here's the differences down the bottom here. And what I've plotted here on this dotted curve is the percentage change relative to the original curve. And so you can see in here the percentage changes are you know, just a few percent. It's not the sort of thing that you can notice. But out here, especially on the warm end, you can see you can go from, say, one or two events a year or whatever the unit is we're dealing with to four or five or six or seven. Something that was originally rare suddenly becomes much more common. And because it's at the very high end, it has consequences. This is where you're perhaps going outside of the realm of previous experience even. And this has been occurring more and more in recent years. An example of this was published recently by Jim Hansen. This is a slightly different depiction, but it relates to the same kind of thing. And here he's actually looking at the average temperatures for June, July, August in the Northern Hemisphere. So this is the summertime temperatures in the Northern Hemisphere. And he's looking at all of the points around the Northern Hemisphere as to their distribution. And always around the Northern Hemisphere or, or anywhere, um, in the Southern Hemisphere, you expect that there are warm spots and there are cold spots. And so uh, there's, there's the average, and then there's the warm spots and cold spots, which are associated with the large-scale waves that occur in the atmosphere. And here it's divided up into three. So a third occurs near the middle, and then there's the, uh, the high temperatures and the low temperatures. And this is what it looked like, the distribution actually looked like from 1951 to 1980. And you'll see it actually fits this bell-shaped distribution quite well. But then if you look at 1981 to 1991, you can see it's shifted a little bit to the right. It's, things have warmed up a little bit. And here from 1991 to 2001, it shifted some more, and it's also spread out a little bit. And from 2001 to 2011, it's spread out a bit more, and the peak is, peak is down. Uh, and so there's a lot less occurring out here on what used to be uh, the cold end of things. And instead, we've got a whole new category out here of events that are occurring 10% of the time that never occurred at all before in this, in this last decade or so. And so these are the cases where we've gone outside of the realm of previous existence, and this has consequences in, in many ways. So we'll, we'll look at some of those. This is what it looks like uh, in the United States. Normally, if you have a, a temperature record at, at uh, say, uh, for the US or for, for Australia, as time goes on, you expect to occasionally break records simply because a weather system occurs in a slightly different place or an optimal place, and, uh, and you go outside of the realm of uh, previous uh, values that have occurred. But you expect that you will break records on the warm side and the cold side at the same rate. And in the US, uh, you can see, actually, here's the ratio of the cold records and the warm records. In the 1950s, it was about 1 to 1. It was less than that. The cold records were actually exceeding the warm records in the 60s and 70s. And in the 80s, it was edging up more to more warm records. In the 90s, it was about 1.4 to 1. And by the 2000s, it was about 2 to 1. And then if we look at more recent times, if we look at 2010, it's about 2.3 to 1, 2011, 2.7 to 1. And for the first six months or so of this year, it was running at a ratio of 9 to 1. So this is where there's clear evidence of climate change, that we're breaking records on the high side. This is not uh, something that would occur in an unchanging climate. And so the attribution with respect to storms um, is the heading here. And, and I'm going to talk more about storms uh, as we go on. But uh, under the IPCC in, in 2007, it was, we stated that global warming is unequivocal. There's no doubt whatsoever that warming is happening and that it's very likely caused by human activities. And so 
I ask the question, shouldn't we then assume that global warming is happening? It's been proven in many studies. But this is not the way most scientists actually work. Instead, they set up a null hypothesis which says, let's assume that there's no human, uh, no human influence on any particular event, and then we have to prove that there is. And this annoys me like crazy, and I think it's, it's the wrong approach to, to doing things, because it turns out this is very difficult to do, given the large natural variability all of the weather that we normally have. And a key difference is if you assume the null hypothesis that there is hu a human influence on climate instead of that there isn't, then all of the uncertainties and the errors and the problems with models fall down on the side of suggesting, oh, there is a human influence on climate. And so this is a problem I think we have in the science in the way in which we go about looking at this. And, uh, and I think we come to the wrong conclusions in many of the studies that have actually been published. So let's talk about what is actually happening with physically in terms of climate change. The carbon dioxide is increasing in the atmosphere. The greenhouse gases are increasing. So what does that do? Well, carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas, which means it helps to trap some of the energy that would normally escape to space, the infrared radiation that would normally go back to space. Scientists call this radiative forcing. If you estimate what that is, it turns out it's quite small. The effect of the increases in greenhouse gases in the atmosphere is about 1% to 2% of the natural flow of energy through the climate system. And so on a day-to-day -day basis, this is not actually something that you would perceive in any way. But it's always going in the same direction. It's always producing a warming. Now, the main place where that accumulates is in the oceans. And so the oceans are systematically warming up. Sea level is rising as a consequence of the expansion of the oceans. In addition, there's a lot of ice melting on land, filling up the oceans, which also contributes to sea level rise. And if we look at the, um, the cumulative effects of this for the ocean, we see that the ocean temperatures have indeed warmed up uh, uh, and, and ice has melted. And the atmosphere above the oceans then is warmer, and it turns out it's also moister. I'll give you some numbers on that very, very, very shortly. On land, it's more of a mixed bag of things. But the places when it does accumulate on land is when we get into a drought. So I want to expand on that a little bit later. And I will argue that the effect is about a 5 to 10% effect in terms of its changes in, in precipitation, in particular precipitation intensity. And so this is much larger than the 1 to 2%. And this is perceptible. So one of the key things then is that the environment that all storms form in these days is different than it used to be, say, prior to the 1970s. In particular, storms reach out and grab moisture from over the oceans and bring it on land. This is a part of the hydrological cycle. There's more moisture there. And as a result, it rains harder when it does rain. So I want to describe that in, in the next couple of slides. And, uh, and so, one of the things that happens with a warmer atmosphere is that it can hold more moisture. This is actually very fundamental as to why it rains. Uh, the, the atmosphere, the air, uh, has some moisture in it. Uh, it rises, uh, maybe because of uh, heating from the sun. But as it rises, it moves into lower pressure, so it expands. And when it expands, it cools. It can no longer hold the moisture anymore, and it rains. It's very fundamental to, to why, it, why it actually rains as to as to this uh, water holding capacity of the atmosphere. But then this has relevance for climate change, because as it warms, it means that the atmosphere can hold more moisture, and in fact, it does. And over the ocean, the relative humidity tends to remain about the same. So as it gets warmer, there's more moisture in the atmosphere. And the number turns out to be about 4% more these days than there used to be, say, prior to about the 1970s, probably about 5% overall due to climate change. And that's consistent with about a 0.6 degrees 
uh, Celsius increase in sea surface temperatures in the last 50 years or so. Another aspect, a uh, way of thinking about this is, um, you know, how do we control temperature? How does, how does your body actually control the temperature of your body? It's remarkable. You know, if, if you go to the doctor and you're running a fever, you know, one of the things he does is to take the temperature of you and see whether everything's all right. How does your body maintain that constant temperature? Well, one of the main ways is actually through perspiration, through sweat, which evaporates from, from your skin and it keeps you cool. And this works also in places that are reasonably dry in the interior of, of Australia, in, in the area which I live in. People can have evaporative coolers and they moisten the atmosphere at, and, and, uh, at the expense of raising the temperature. And, and, so, uh, and so this is one way in which you can keep things cooler. Evaporative cooling works very effectively. And it works very effectively for the planet Earth because 70% of the planet is ocean. There's, there's always plenty of water there. And so if the heat goes into evaporating moisture, instead of raising temperature, you know, you don't perceive it as an increase in temperature. But if it goes into evaporating moisture, the moisture has to go somewhere, and it has consequences, and one of those consequences is heavier rains. And this is something which is not adequately appreciated in this whole issue of climate change. Another example, you know, if it's been raining and the ground is wet, you know, the, one of the first things that happens when the sun comes out is that the puddles dry up. The heat goes into evaporating the moisture and drying things out, and then the temperature starts to go up. Well, it's a little more complicated than that, but as a, as a first approximation, that's what, that's what happens. And so it, it highlights the fact that water is actually the air conditioner of the planet. If there's plenty of water around, the temperature is apt not to go up as much. If you go hiking in the mountains or in, in Australia, go into the interior of, uh, of Australia, and you don't have a water bottle, you can end up with heat stroke. If you have a water bottle and you can keep, uh, keep plenty of liquid in you, you're much more likely to survive. So precipitation is very important, and so let's talk a little bit about that. And so this is a summary then of the issues relating to the changes in, in water and, and precipitation. With warming, there's more heat, there's higher temperatures, and the atmosphere can hold more water vapor, and the rate is 7% per degree Celsius. It's sometimes a useful number to remember. Um, in over wet areas where it's ocean, there is more moisture as a consequence of this. Over the desert, it depends on the availability of moisture, and if there's no moisture, then the temperature will just go up, and, and you won't get an increase in moisture. So on, on land in general, it's about um, uh, a half to two-thirds of, of this number um, as to what is happening. So with more heat, there's more evaporation, and there's more precipitation. Mm, that's relatively modest but it does mean that there's longer dry spells and there's more drought where it's not raining. And where it is raining, there are more intense rains and also more intense snows where it snows. This is certainly relevant in the United States. And we can also, as a consequence of this, get more intense storms. So I want to talk about these things a little bit more. As a result, at the extremes of these, there's a greater risk of floods and a greater risk of droughts. And I put risk in here because you know, you can mitigate floods if you've got good drainage systems, and you can mitigate droughts if you've got irrigation and plenty of water stored somewhere. In addition, the, the snow season tends to get shorter. So this is very important in many countries, and, and at middle and high latitudes and in mountain regions. The snow melt uh, accelerates as a consequence of a little bit of extra heat that's available, and so you end up with less snowpack in the springtime, and there is earlier runoff. Uh, the stream flow uh, peaks earlier in the, in the spring. Um, in the Sierra Nevadas, in the western parts of the United States, the peak runoff occurs about seven to 10 days earlier now than it did 30 years ago. Um, this means that there's less water 
as you go into the summertime, and the summertime is when you've got more heat, when you actually need the water. This exacerbates the risk of drought as you go into the summer. All storms reach out and grab the available moisture and bring it into the storm. And in fact, the rule of thumb is overall that they reach out about a factor of four times the radius of the precipitation. You can, you can get this number fairly simply. It's not too hard to do if you look at the rainfall rates that occur when a storm occurs. There, you know, there, there can be incredible rates. You can easily get 25 or 50 millimeters of, of rain in a day, but the evaporation rates are typically about three millimeters per day. The rain does not come directly from the evaporation. It comes from the moisture which is in the atmosphere, and the storm circulation reaches out and grabs that moisture and brings it in and concentrates it and dumps it down in the form of rain. This is most easily seen in the case of things like hurricanes, where you can see the spiral armbands sp spiraling the moisture into the storm to feed the storm. And in fact, the average uh, radius of a, of a hurricane is about 400 kilometers, but the average moisture flow and the, the circulation that feeds into that storm is actually coming in from about 1,600 kilometers away, and it spirals into that storm. And in fact, when you think about it, how come we, we can actually see these hurricanes? You see these nice pictures of all these spiral armbands looking down from space in, in the satellites. And, and one reason you can see those is because it's relatively clear all around, usually. And in fact, it's clear all around because that's a part of the hurricane circulation. So there's rising air in the hurricane sinking in the regions outside. And the, that sinking air then spirals back into the storm, and the storm gathers all this moisture over this large region in order to feed its own precipitation. And that precipitation, when it, when it gets released, gives rise to latent heat. It gives up the heat that normally went into the evaporating the moisture in the first place, makes the air more buoyant, and therefore makes the storm more buoyant. And so the storm itself gets more intense as well. And so, with more moisture in the atmosphere, it means that there's heavier rains. And the storms are apt to be more intense. This is a, a record from uh, Lisa Alex Alexander, who was in the audience here, uh, published uh, quite some time ago now, and it was in the uh, IPCC report in uh, 2007. And, uh, and this shows the regions around the world where the, the very wet days were occurring, the, uh, the changes in the wet days, the, the top 5% of the, of the wet days, how they're changing over time. You can see a certain amount of speckled data here, which is, of course, partly the very character of precipitation. Precipitation is intermittent. It, it, it's, it tends to be spotty inherently. But there's a lot more blues in here. And on a global basis, in the places where we had measurements, there was a clear increase and so, you know, when it rains, it pours. When it rains, it rains harder than it used to. And there are certain regions of the globe, like uh, in, in North America, where this is really spectacularly the case. So here's my little cartoon analogy to try to talk you through about how, about how to think about this. So this is the bathtub analogy. And over here on the left, I've got a bathtub. So this is the flow of moisture into the atmosphere. So this is the evaporation, if you like. This is the amount of moisture that which is stored in the atmosphere. And typically, over Australia, uh, certainly in coastal regions, there's about um, 25 millimeters of moisture in the atmosphere above us. In the tropics, it can get up to about 50 millimeters. But that's about the maximum that can be stored uh, in the atmosphere. And then we've got a a plug hole here. Let me see if I've got a plug. There's a plug. Um, and you know, you have to take the plug away from the hole in order to let the rain come out. So this is the precipitation that's coming out here. So this is sort of the before warming. And then this is after warming. And so what you see here is that the evaporation is a little bit greater. Not a lot, a little bit greater. But that the tub is a lot 
fuller. This, this, the rate at which the tub uh, fills up is much greater than the rate at which it's supplied here. And so then, uh, so there's a couple of things that says here, and, and then the, um, the outflow has to be even more intermittent than it was before in order to maintain this higher level. Because there's more water in the tub, when you take the plug away, the, the rate at which the water comes out the, this hole is much faster than it is in this case here. In other words, it rains harder because there's more moisture in the atmosphere. But if you left the plug, uh, open, plug hole open for too long, you would drain the tub. If you did that, then you would have to recharge the atmosphere. You would have to put the water back in the tub before quite a long time before you could get the next storm. So that would correspond to a drought. In other words, you change not only in the intensity of the storm, you also change the frequency of the storm, and, and you know, the, the, long, the longer dry spells are apt to occur as a consequence. So, so this uh, sort of summarizes the, the views here that when it rains, it rains harder. Um, the floods and droughts occur, but of course they're occurring at different places at different or different times. And Australia is a very good example of this. Uh, longer dry spells and greater risk of drought is one of the uh, consequences. And I've said, well, witness Australia, the prolonged drought until 2010 and then widespread floods. So here's uh, another key point is that frequently in our science, we look at precipitation, we look at the changes in precipitation. We also look at temperature. And the connection between the two is often forgotten. And yet there's a very strong connection. And I've described that in part because the atmosphere can hold more moisture when, when, it's, uh, when it's warmer. But it turns out over land, there is a strong negative correlation between temperature and precipitation variations especially in the summertime and throughout the tropics year-round, and this certainly applies to Australia. And so the way to think about this is that in a cyclonic regime, in a low-pressure regime, this is when you go to the barometer on the wall and you tap it and there's low pressure and it says unsettled weather or something to that effect. And uh, so it's cloudy, there's less sun, there's less energy coming in in the first place to, to raise temperatures. Secondly, there's more rain, there's more moisture on the soils, there's plenty of water to evaporate. As a result, uh, more energy goes into evaporating moisture, which is referred to here as latent heat increases, and the temperature doesn't increase as much. The sensible heat, is, as it's referred to here, is less. And so the rain is higher and the temperature is lower under the circumstance. And under an anticyclonic regime, when there's fine weather and, and high pressure, then it's sunny, there's more energy coming in, more heat to get rid of somehow or the other, but it's also dry, there's less soil moisture. As a result, there's no evaporative cooling. All of the heat goes into raising temperature, which is what these things are saying. And so temperature tends to be higher and rain is lower. And the consequence is that you tend to get either hot and dry conditions or you get cool and wet conditions, but we tend not to get the other combinations. So, uh, and so this is, and, and, and I think Australia is a very good example uh, of this. So let's see, where are we going? So now I want to, this is the conceptual basis. Now you've learned a little bit of science about how we think extremes, and especially the water side of things, are changing with climate change. And now I want to talk about some examples. So firstly, uh, an Australian example, 2009 on the 7th of February. Um, Melbourne got up to 46.4 degrees Celsius. For the Americans in the audience, it's 117 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, there was drought for about two months prior to this. There were intense heat waves, very strong winds. There were bushfires galore, and over a hundred, uh, over a million acres were were burned. Uh, there was 173 deaths, and 2,030 houses were destroyed. And so this is a map of uh, the destruction areas. 
and uh, this, this is sort of the record uh, at Melbourne showing the heat waves here and then this, was, this is so-called Black Saturday on the 7th of February and it so happens I landed in Melbourne on the 7th of February for a conference uh, in Melbourne at that time and I got to see some of these wildfires uh, right up close and, and personal unfortunately. Um, the, the second example is, is Russia. I mentioned that before, so this is a year or so later, in August of 2010. I showed this before. This is all of the wildfires uh, from satellites and, and all of the smoke that was going around. This is a famous region just off of uh, Red Square, uh, St. Basil. Uh, you may recognize it, but uh, it's all hidden in the smoke, and the wildfires were uh, all over the place. Uh, but at the same time, it turns out, there was flooding in both China and India, and spectacularly so in Pakistan. And so the Indus River, at, at this stage actually, quite a number of the rains had already occurred, but they just hadn't uh, filtered down into the river. And this is what the river looked like two or three weeks later. It had expanded and there was something like 300,000 people that were displaced as a result of the flooding that occurred at the same time that the heat wave was going on in Russia. And so here's some uh, numbers here, 56,000 deaths, uh, $15 billion in, in damages estimated, uh, over 2,000 buildings destroyed. There were major crop failures, especially wheat. This had an impact on the international marketplace for wheat, the cost of uh, basic, basic staples went up throughout the world, and especially it went up in the Middle East and, and uh, Northern Africa, and it led to, in some sense, the Arab Spring was partly a consequence of these increases in price, prices and the, the, uh, the tensions that resulted. And there were a number of places that got uh, up to a border 40 degrees Celsius. Um, so when we look at an event like this, Immediately, we look around to see, well, what else is going on that might be associated with this? And I already showed you that there was some flooding in India and Pakistan and, and, uh, and China not that far away. It turns out there were very high sea surface temperatures in the tropical Indian Ocean. This is what SST refers to. And I want to show, talk to you about the sea surface temperature distribution. There was also pretty low Arctic sea ice at that time, and we can ask the question, well, was that, was that related to what was going on in Russia? And there's been some studies which suggest, well, maybe it played a little bit of a role, but I, we don't think that that was the major player. Uh, and there were, was this high precipitation, and there was a La Nina going on at that time. The distribution of many of these things was related to the La Nina. And so this is the record in Moscow, uh, the overall climatology is given by this line, and this is the temperature record. And you can see this is the peak of the heat wave here in, uh, in July into about mid-August. But you can see it was hot for several months ahead of time, and in fact, there was a drought going on, uh, especially all throughout this period. This is what the pattern looks like. You can see a cold patch here. Whoa, uh, warm, cold, warm, oh, evidence of atmospheric waves, right? And here's over here evidence of the La Nina, very cool conditions in the tropical Pacific, very warm conditions over Australia and the Indian Ocean. So let's look at that in, in more detail. And the study that we've done, we've focused on the period from mid-June until mid-August, about a two-month period. This is what was happening in the tropical Pacific. Uh, so here we refer to the, the tropical Pacific, here's Australia down here, and a region called Nino 3.4, that's, that's this region here in the tropical Pacific, as an indicator of what's going on with regard to El Nino. And if we take the sea surface temperatures in that region, the departures from normal, this is what they look like. And so they indicate whether there is a La Nina, as there was in 2008, and a smaller one in 2009, and then a, spec then a, you know, a, a moderate El Nino, from May of 2009 to May of 2010. This, is, this turns out to be a key part of what was going on, in part because of this very rapid changeover to a La Nina that was going on in the latter part of 2010 and into 2011. 
And the reason why that's the case is revealed here. This is the overall sea surface temperatures around the world at that time. And this is the departure from normal from 1951 to 1970. Now I've used the period 1951 to 1970 because that's before most of the human-induced warming occurred. And so we, what we're seeing here is the result of natural variability associated with the La Nina in the Pacific, but also um, uh, the natural variability, but also a global warming component is included in here. And what you see is some spectacularly warm uh, water over here in the Indian Ocean, around Australia, and also in the Atlantic Ocean going on at this particular time. And we can look at that in, in more detail, and we've looked at it in a number of places around the world. If you look in the northern Indian Ocean, the Arabian Sea, the Bay of Bengal, and this is the time series of all of the monthly anomalies at that region for this particular region, and you'll see that in March of 2010, that was the highest temperature on record in that region, 30.4 degrees Celsius, uh, point, nearly one degree Celsius above normal. Now, it cooled off pretty rapidly thereafter, after the monsoon got set in, but of course, the fact that it was so warm means that it was tremendous evaporative cooling going on. Moisture was pouring into the atmosphere, so what happens? That moisture gets dumped when the monsoons rains, wherever the monsoon rains carry it, and a lot of that was in China and India and Pakistan in particular. And so this is the, the summary then of, of what was going on. I'm not going to show you all of those other place, all the other places, but there was record high sea temperatures in the northern Indian Ocean. There was also record high sea temperatures a little bit later in August of 2010 in the Gulf of Mexico. There was record high sea temperatures north of uh, South America in the Caribbean in September of 2010 and there were record high sea temperatures in the region just north of Australia in December of 2010, and September, October, November was the second highest on record. And I'm going to talk a bit more about what happened in Australia later in the year, later in that year, uh, as, as we go on. And so the consequences were the flooding in Pakistan nearby, the second most active hurricane season since uh, 1944 on record, uh, major floods in Colombia and Venezuela and the northern part of South America, and also the Queensland floods in December, January of, of 2000 and, uh, 2010 into 2011. There have been a number of studies on this, and the studies tend to zoom in on what happened in, in Russia. And I don't know if you can see this. This is the Mediterranean down here. Uh, there's the UK here, and there was high pressure in this region, a spectacularly high pressure region called a blocking anticyclone is what it's referred to. But this is what it actually looks like if you look at it from a global perspective. It turns out, indeed, this was a spectacularly high pressure circulation feature, but it's not the only one. There are several others around the world. And uh, there are some down here in the Southern Hemisphere also. But this is, this is uh, winter time. You sort of expect it in winter. In summer, you don't expect this kind of intensity and, and uh, with, with lasting so long also. And there are some patterns in the atmosphere relating to waves. Uh, you know, maybe these things are actually connected to one another. And it turns out there is a pattern in the atmosphere. Um, Non-scientists don't have to worry about this. but. Uh, you know, wave number six, one, two, three, four, five, six, is the natural pattern of waves that tends to be relatively stationary, relatively uh, slow moving that occurs, but it's not actually a straight east-west pattern here. In fact, there's some real evidence that, you know, maybe there's some other connections that turn out to be important that we want to explore. So when we look around and analyze the precipitation that was going on for this two-month period, this is the global pattern of precipitation. This area here is called the intertropical convergence zone. Uh, it used to be called the, the doldrums region. Uh, tremendous amount of rainfall in that region. And of course, here's the monsoon region, the northern monsoon, and also in, in Mexico. And uh, it's the winter monsoon, if you like to think of it that way, in Australia. 
And then this is the departure from normal. And so the rains were much, much heavier than normal in this region, which is, of course, where the sea temperatures were much above normal. And also in this region here, north of Australia, and in the northern Indian Ocean, and um, including the Bay of Bengal and the Arabian Sea. And there's a little tongue in here going up over Mexico. The, the actual floods don't show up particularly well in, in, uh, on this, this particular graphic. So this means that there is extra heat being pumped into the atmosphere in these regions. If there's heat going on in the atmosphere, there has to be consequences. The atmosphere has to respond. The, the, if there's more heat going into the atmosphere in the form of latent heat being released by precipitation, the air has to rise. That can do several things, which I now want to talk about. So we can actually calculate those values. This is what our calculation reveals of the atmospheric heating that's going on. Uh, the units here are in watts per square meter. Uh, this is the pattern that looks very like the precipitation pattern. And down the bottom here are the departures from normal. This is the places where the atmosphere is being superheated, if you like to think of it that way. And this is where it's much cooler than normal in the region where the, El Nin uh, the La Nina was playing a role. And so these regions are places where there is important forcing of the atmosphere. There are important effects that influence the atmospheric flow. So now we're in the slightly technical, more technical part of the talk. Uh, but this is, this is what is sort of happening here. Uh, let's see, I'll activate some of these things on the left so you can read those as we go along if you like. But in, so in the, this is a northern hemisphere picture where if you have high sea surface temperatures, that tends to be where the action is occurring. There's extra moisture that's available to the atmosphere. The cold region where the La Nina is occurring is where the action isn't. And so where the action is, all of the air tends to flow into that region. Warm air rises, right? And so the warm air tends to rise, and I've depicted that as a massive thunderstorm, if you like to think of it that way. But these are often uh, big, much bigger uh, complexes of different kinds. And then at the top of the atmosphere, the air flows out. And as it flows out, it gets caught by the rotation of the Earth. And so it starts to rotate to the right in the northern hemisphere, and it creates a circulation, an anticyclonic circulation in the upper part of the atmosphere, and it creates then a wave, what we call teleconnections in the atmosphere, and so it has consequences downstream. This is a summary of what we think happened in this particular time, and here we're looking at the outflow from all of these regions around the world for this two-month period. And there was major outflow from this region here. Part of it goes into the southern hemisphere, where it creates the dry conditions in the, in the wintertime over Australia. Part of it goes over into this region here. It's called the Walker Circulation. So it's a relationship between the monsoon and the La Nina conditions. This is called the Hadley Circulation. Part of it normally goes up into this region and the subsidence, subsiding air, over the Mediterranean, and it gives rise to the Mediterranean climate. The Mediterranean climate, uh, if you look at any textbook, you will see Mediterranean climate is fine, settled weather day after day uh, in, in the Mediterranean region. But it didn't occur this year. And instead, what we think happened is that it shifted up into this region I've called the Russian heat wave, RHW. And you can see this sort of outflow going up into that region there. And so some of the monsoon vertical motion the up rising air was sinking over this region. Now, there are other things going on, and I've, I've got a wraparound point over here. So the Russian heat wave is also over here. And over in the Atlantic sector, there was strong activity here, very strong uh, subsiding air down into the subtropics of the southern hemisphere. And in fact, there was a major drought going on in Brazil as a consequence of this at this time. But meanwhile, major flooding going on up in the northern part of South America. And as we saw before, there was some extra things going on up here in the northern hemisphere, which relates to the previous slide that I just showed you. Let's see. And so it set up this, what we call a Rossby wave, an actual wave pattern. So there was an anticyclone that formed in this region here as a consequence of all of this heating. It set up this wave. 
and it displaced what would normally be high pressure over, over the Mediterranean into this region here. And so the Russian heat wave anticyclone, it turns out, was partly forced by what's going on in the Atlantic and partly by the tremendous strong monsoon circulation that was going on in Asia. There have been statistical studies as to what happens under, under climate change. And, and my observation is that when um, that you expect to have a whole lot of records being broken when natural variability is going in the same direction as global warming. So on the warm side of things, if it's already going to be warm because you've got an anticyclone in summertime, uh, then that's when you're, you're apt to break records. And there's been a couple of analyses, I've got some, uh, some authors' names on, on here, which suggested that in Russia, there was an 80% probability that the July 2010 Russian heat wave could, could, would not have occurred without climate warming. And another view of that was that the probability increased by a factor of five. But these are both statistical statements, and what our study has done is to show you actually how this came about and why it has some uniqueness to it, why it didn't occur the next year, why it, why it may not occur again for, for some time, but the odds of this sort of thing, these sort of things coming together are increasing. We've also done a number of studies with climate models to try and simulate this, and it turns out the climate models have difficulty in simulating monsoon rains, and they have difficulty in dealing with these blocking anticyclones. And so it is not, we have not been able to replicate this. If you use such a flawed model to try and do statements of is this a cause or an effect, then you'll come to the wrong conclusion. And there have been several papers published that have come to the wrong conclusion in this regard. Instead, we think that indeed, the evidence suggests quite strongly that the very high sea surface temperatures in the tropical Atlantic and in the, and in the tropical Indian Ocean were related to the anomalous atmospheric circulation that set up this heat wave in Russia. And so it has a human component to it. So when we turn to the flooding in Queensland uh, in early January of 2011, um, you can see a map there of some of the heavy rains, and uh, uh, you know, here's a little bit more detail. This is what the sea surface temperature anomalies looked like at this time. And oh, so this is, this is actual sea surface temperatures, and this is the anomalies here. And it turns out, as I mentioned before, this region north of Australia was the highest on record for any December that, that has ever occurred, just north of Australia. And you can see some of the consequences here and some of the wild weather that was occurring at that time. Well, there's some interest, very interesting uh, results or consequences of this. This is the global sea level record I mentioned before, that sea level goes up with, with, uh, with warming, both because the, the ocean is expanding and also because there's more ice on land melting going into the ocean to fill the ocean up. And overall, it's going up at a rate of about 3.1 millimeters per year. So a steady rise um, overall for this record, something like 55 millimeters since the record began. And this is when we launched uh, into space a satellite or a series of satellites in the different colors here that are looking down and making measurements of the global sea level to millimeter accuracy using an altimeter. So this is like an active radar. And uh, you can see the individual measurements here. And then there are monthly values that are on here in the blue curve. And you can see some wiggles in here. This turns out to be an El Nino. Uh, this turns out to be La Nina. And then there's the spectacular drop here relative to what was sort of expected by about five millimeters in 2010. And what actually happened in this period, this is looking now at um, January to April, January, February, March, April of 2011 versus 2010. And what you can see is all of this rain that occurred in Australia. There was rains down here and up in northern Siberia. Uh, the Missouri flooded in, in North America as a consequence of very, very heavy snows at this time. And here's the tremendous amount of rains that occurred in Colombia and, and Venezuela. And what actually happened here is that there was sufficient water taken out of the ocean 
and dumped on land in this event, this is a unique event in, in uh, recorded history at least, to lower the sea level by five millimeters. And the most spectacular example of this was what actually happened in Australia. In Australia, this is the record from the 1st of August 2010 until the 30th of April 2011. And these dark blue spots are where it was the rec wettest on record for this period. But, and all of the rest of Australia, except down in the southwest, was in the top 10 percentile. The, the, you know, in other words, it was very wet in those regions as well. And it turns out if you add up all of the rain that occurred there, it's equivalent to taking 2.5 millimeters out of the global ocean and dumping it on Australia. And of course, the consequence was that there was a big lake formed in the middle of Australia, which, which you call Lake Eyre. I mean, that's pretty remarkable that you, know, you can actually lower the global sea level by this amount just by dumping so much water on land. And so we're near the uh, end of the talk now, but um, oh, actually, I'm going to quickly run through a few other examples going into 2011. But you know, the key moral of the story here is that for the most part, the weather patterns in El Nino go on. We can't tell if there's El Nino changes or not, because our understanding of El, the El Nino phenomenon is not sufficient, and our ability to model it is not quite as good as we would like. It may well be that it's changing, but we can't really tell. But we do know that the floods and the droughts that go along with El Nino and La Nina are getting more severe in different parts of the world. And, and so that's, I think, the, probably the best interpretation we can give as to what is actually going on. So the, the heat waves, the flooding, the droughts around the world are becoming more intense as a consequence. So when we go to 2011, there was uh, tremendous flooding along the Mississippi River as well. This is an example here in uh, going from April to May. And it uh, turns out uh, this was the third 500-year flood in the last, uh, what, 20 years. Well, of course, they're not 500-year floods anymore. That's one of the consequences. And there were a tremendous amount of tornadoes, a huge loss of life in Joplin, Missouri. Uh, I've got some nice movies of those, but I don't really have time to show them, unfortunately. But if you ask, I could. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, not uh, a little bit later, by June, Arizona was on fire, uh, the worst wildfires in Arizona, and, and there was a major drought, and the worst wildfire ever in Texas. Uh, 500, 600 homes were lost in this, this particular fire, uh, over 14,000 uh, acres in, in September and uh, record heat in places like, like Dallas, uh, over, over 40 degrees uh, Celsius. And uh, you know, then in 2012, this is in Colorado. And so um, I live in Boulder, Colorado. And this is a picture of part of Boulder, Colorado here. Uh, there was the so-called Waldo Canyon fire where, uh, near uh, Colorado Springs, where there were 346 homes lost. And uh, you know, this is the High Park fire in, with, uh, near Fort Collins, uh, 259 houses lost. lost. And uh, somewhere here, let's see, right there is my institution, NCAR, the National Center for Atmospheric Research. And about one and a half kilometers away, there was a wildfire that, that actually shut down uh, NCAR for a couple of days because the air quality, the smoke was just too great, and you couldn't run the computers or anything like that. And then, uh, and so this year, uh, this is you know July. It was the this is the actual temperatures. You can see the numbers here. The, this is the average temperature. You know the average temperature was uh, you know over 35 degrees uh, Celsius in in many regions. Um, this is, includes in day and night, right? And this is the departure from normal. You know eight. What is that? An eight degrees Fahrenheit. So uh, you, you know uh, five degrees. Celsius or something like that. And here's the overall record for July. And you can see the value here in July. Uh, it finally beat out the 1930s. This is the so-called Dust Bowl era in the United States. And this has always been hanging over us that, oh, there was this Dust Bowl era. And it was much drier back in here than it was uh, with this tremendous drought that we've had even this year in the United States. But we broke. We broke most of the records that occurred back in the 1930s. Uh, 
And so, with regard to the attribution of extremes, often we cannot say that these events were caused by global warming. In fact, that's, we're often asked that. Is this due to global warming? It's not the right question, because there is, I would say, always a global warming component to what is going on nowadays. But most of what is going on is the natural variability, the weather. And I mentioned before, you know, how large is this effect? And I suggested that, you know, maybe it's in the neighborhood of 5 to 10 percent. And we can argue that that's the kind of number you get in an extended drought. We could talk a little bit more about that if you like. But I do think, because we're breaking these records, that it's highly likely that these events would not have occurred without global warming. Just remember, this is the only planet we've got. Thank you very much.